um, as we always do with uh, some singing, but unfortunately in the space we can't have uh, public singing, so I'll be leading. Folks at home are certainly welcome to uh, uh, take a look at the online bulletin that we've provided and join in singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, O ye nations, rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed the incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. And I'm going to invite Erin uh, Kendall to join us up front here. She's going to be signing the words to Open Doors. And we hope all of you in the room will uh, sign along and just do the best you can. No one's watching. And uh, again, folks at home, please uh, join us in singing. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. We welcome all who seek to love the Lord. Bring your joys, bring your burdens, all you rich and poor. Open hearts, open minds, open hearts, open doors. We gather here to praise and worship in our diversity we find a common ground we speak a language of one god one love seek the lord sing god's praise with joyful sound open hearts open minds open doors we welcome all who seek to love the lord bring your joys bring your burdens all you rich and poor, open hearts, open minds, open hearts, open doors. Open hearts, open minds, open hearts, open doors. Good morning. Is your mic on? Um, if you're worshiping online, you may do everything that way. You're, you may turn in your prayer concerns, um, record your attendance, and also make your offering. If you're here in person, uh, you may do all that. And please, please uh, record your attendance and your contact information so that if we need to do contact tracing, um, we can do that. Thank you. Uh, our Sounds of the Season uh, music series continues this afternoon, 4 o'clock. There will be a recorded Lessons and Carols service uh, online, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Also, uh, we are doing an online Christmas word cloud. Uh, just go to the website and put in a word, one word, and you can do one word several times, of um, what Christmas means to you. So just for example, 
One word for Christmas would be? Love. Love. Okay. So do that, and we want to get a big word cloud for Christmas. Tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, um, we're having a Blue Christmas worship service for the first time uh, this year. Uh, and you can participate either through the website, watching it by live stream, or recorded um, at another time. Or you can also choose to come in person and participate in that service. Then, uh, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we have several ways that you can participate in worshiping God. There's a family service that's a Zoom service at 4.30 and you can uh, link up with that uh, through instructions on the website. There will also be a, an organ prelude, organ and piano prelude um, by Andrew, a half an hour of music, and then a pre-recorded Christmas Eve worship service. Those will be available after 6 p.m. On, uh, on Christmas Eve. You can watch those online. But here in the parking lot at 7.30, just for a short service between 7.30 and 8, we're going to have candlelight and caroling outside. Dress for the season, uh, the place will be lit up with luminaries, and you will have a, a candle and we'll sing some carols outside, mask, and... Um, Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Let's hear a reading from Luke 2, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child laying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. I wonder about the shepherds making their way towards Bethlehem after the angel's invitation. How disoriented they might have been by that light that broke through their sleepy night sky by the vision of angels before them, by the announcement God was bringing good news and they were invited to be a part of it? Did the darkness seem even deeper when the light withdrew? Did they rub their eyes with their fists when the angels disappeared? Did the circles of light remain in their vision after the encounter with the angels, like what happens when you accidentally look in the sun and then look away? The shepherds don't have any trouble making up their mind to travel across that dark land. They seemed to make their way through it, and to the light the angels had proclaimed, quickly and easily. Which makes me wonder, were the night shift shepherds the first ones invited to visit because they were used to the darkness and could traverse it confidently? Their eyes were trained for that environment. They trusted the world at night, and themselves in it. So why do people choose to make their way through darkness? A consideration is that we come to see what is here and to discover who we are in the presence of what we find. Could that have been what the shepherds were after too? Night after night under that wide sky, they probably had a sense of perspective of how they fit into the world. But when the angels come with their news and call it good and say that it's for everyone, it's an invitation to set out and to see what is there and to discover who they are in the presence of what they find. And this is more than just about the shepherds. When they arrive, they tell Mary and Joseph and the baby all that the angels told them. And then the, it, the shepherds leave rejoicing. They've become carriers, bearers of God's good news and witnesses to it. Mary stays pondering. She's been a bearer of that news in her own way. And now she's the recipient of others rejoicing over it. One thing to think about is that everyone becomes new through this encounter, birthed in the darkness and proclaimed in the light.
A reading from 1 Peter in the second chapter, 22 through 25. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. And from first, from John's first chapter. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. There's a difference between talking about doing something and actually doing something. I'm going to clean the basement. I'm going to clean the basement. There's a difference between talking about doing that and actually doing that. I'm going to weed the garden today. There's an a, a difference between actually talking about that and doing it. This is the difference between hot air and action. It's between walking and talking the talk. Part of what we mean by incarnation is putting the word into deed. The word becomes flesh. There's a difference between talking about love and loving between talking about forgiveness and forgiving, between talking about mercy and being merciful. Now, James, in his letter, puts this very clearly. If a brother or sister is ill-clad or in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Faith is to be incarnated. Now John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. The word incarnated grace and truth. The word that we learned at the beginning of this prologue, the word that was God and was with God, the word through whom everything was made and without whom nothing was made that was made, the word that was life and in that light was the life of all. That word became grace and truth. That word was put into action as grace and truth. It's as if God said, we will show you what grace and truth are. Now, of course, John tells us 
in the next few verses that that word become flesh was Jesus. So Jesus put into flesh what grace and truth are. A few words about grace. Grace is being gracious. Grace is putting the other first. Grace is thinking of the other. It's being thoughtful. Grace is sacrificing for the other. Grace is setting aside one's agenda for the other. Grace is taking the time for the other. Grace might be suffering for the other. It is being generous. It is giving of oneself. It is kindness. It is civility. Grace does not insist on its own way. Grace does not keep score. Now until I do grace, I haven't put grace in action. I have not incarnated grace. Now Paul says something very similar about love. I may speak in the tongues, in human tongues and angelic tongues, but if I have not love, it profits me nothing. So what I've just described about grace has to be put in action. It has to be incarnated. And that's what Jesus does. When we see Jesus healing a leper, putting himself at risk, we see grace incarnated. When we see Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, when we see him talking to this woman who's looked down upon, we see grace in the flesh. When we see him healing the centurion's servant, reaching out to those at the top of society and to those at the bottom of society, we see grace in action. When we see him letting the children come to him, children who would be of no profit to him, we see grace incarnated. When we see him eating with the marginalized, we see grace in the flesh. When we see him feeding the hungry, we see grace incarnated. Jesus embodied grace. This is what grace looks like. You know, sometimes we've used the phrase, do you want to know what kindness looks like? Well, when you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see her picture. Well, that's what this is. When you want to know what grace is, look at Jesus. Now, Richard Rohr, when he talks about the incarnation, says, the incarnation crosses a line. And that line is moving from talk to action. Full of grace and truth. Now, grace is a little easier to talk about than truth. Truth is kind of hard anymore. In a world of lies, in a world of fake news, in a word, world of alternative facts and alternative reality, in a world of truthiness, truth is not a sum of sentences. It's a life. Kierkegaard talks about people who build palaces of words but live in the doghouse next door. Truth does not 
live in the doghouse next door. Truth is being true to one's word. It's being true to one's principles. Truth is integrity. It is commitment. It is being who we are in public the same as who we are in private. And it's being who we are in private as we are in public. Truth will not deal in generalities, but it will deal in particulars. Sometimes we say, I, I love all people. Well, that's a generality. But do we love that person? Do we love that person who rubs us the wrong way and really annoys us and we really wish weren't around? Truth loves in particular. Jesus loved the particular Syrophoenician woman who actually contradicted him. Jesus loved particular people, not people just in general. Truth moves from the abstract to the concrete. And truth will not deny what is in front of it. Truth is not denial. It won't pretend it isn't there. It won't pretend that it isn't bad. It won't pretend that, oh, all's okay. Truth won't say, oh, you really don't have a problem. Truth won't say, I really don't have a problem. Truth will acknowledge the truth that is in front of it, regardless of the cost. This is taking up one's cross, pretending that issue is not there, is not truthful. Acting on what is before us is truthful. In this sense, the truthful person tells the truth. Truth is courageous and it's risky. And again, truth that is incarnated is crossing a line. And people will feel that that line has been crossed by truth tellers. Now truth is shaped by grace. Truth is true to grace. The truth of a life is its fidelity to grace. And the word was full of grace and truth. Now John calls this glory. He says, this is Christ's glory, that he was full of grace and truth. Now, usually when we think of glory, we think of stuff that is flashy and splashy. We think of prestige and power and victory. We think of the football team on the field yesterday lifting the trophy. We think of the parade after winning the soccer, soccer playoff. We think of that kind of glory, which is fulfillment. But Christ's glory is grace and truth, which is a quieter kind of glory. It's not real obtrusive. It's not real showy. Christ's grace and truth is about service 
It's about putting the other first. You know, if anything has been shown in this pandemic, we have seen glory all over the place. And maybe the, the pandemic has bared glory for us, and it's easier to see glory now. Do you know who Sandra Lindsay is? We saw Sandra Lindsay's glory this week. She was the first person with inoculation for the virus. We saw her glory as she received the vaccine. Very simple, very quiet. We have seen glory in our healthcare workers, in the nurses and doctors and those who are on hospital staffs. We have seen glory and grace upon grace. We have seen glory in the frontline workers, in our public servants and those who work in grocery stores. We have seen grace in so many places. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. When we started this series, it began with the word. And you know, what is the word? Well, John describes it in the first five verses. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was this creative principle for the universe. And at the end, he says, the Word is grace and truth. If we connect the dots, the creative principle of the world is grace. The world is about grace. The world was founded on grace. The world is not about getting ahead, getting the edge. The world is not about bullying or me first or belittling or having or power, or prestige. The world is about grace. It's about generosity and gratitude and putting the other first. The purpose of the cosmos, the purpose of creation, is to be graceful. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. We have all received grace upon grace. All. That's gracious in itself, that all receive it. And it's grace upon grace. It's like a fountain. It's almost like a fountain that we can stand under and receive this grace upon grace. We can't get grace. We can't take grace. We can't legislate grace. We can only receive it. Christ comes that we may be in sync with the cosmos. The principle of the cosmos is grace. And God gives us this fountain of grace 
that we can be aligned with creation. I don't hear this talk too much anymore, but there was a period when there was conversation about what the next step in evolution would look like. Would it be stronger people? Would it be brainier people? In the incarnation, we see the next step. It's not stronger. It's not brainier. It's more graceful. The incarnation, the birth of Christ, is not just for Christ. It's for us. The birth is not just of Christ. The birth is our birth also. That we may receive grace upon grace that we can become people who are aligned with the purpose of the universe. May it be so. Amen. This song uh, beautifully pairs Charles Wesley's uh, Advent words, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, with a familiar uh, J.S. Bach music.
so nice. What joys and concerns would you like to share today? Yes, Brett. for Lori's healing from um, a stroke and for comfort for her family. Lord, hear our prayers. And I would add for everyone who is separated from their loved ones as they're facing illness. Lord, hear our prayers. Yeah, Mika. Mika, I heard uh, for Sharon, for Sharon Hayes, who got shot, and for, what was the second name? For Daphne, you said? Right, okay. Yeah. For um, the family of Sharon, who is dealing with her death, her uh, by violence, and uh, and for their comfort and and peace, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Others, Colleen, I'd like to ask for continued prayers for Gary Collins as he is recovering, mm -hmm. and for his family. For Gary Collins' continued recovery, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Yeah. For all those in nursing homes and care facilities who are spending the holidays alone in their room, Lord, Lord hear Lord. our prayers. I'm, I'm really grateful, uh, Chris, for the music that we have here. And uh, I'm grateful, I don't know about you guys, but when Chris is singing, I can have, I can feel like I'm singing in my head. And it's really, really beautiful and comforting. So for the gift of music, Lord, hear our prayers. Let's pray. Gracious God, it's, um, so hard just to look around at the world and understand what's behind it all and what we might find when we turn to the source of it all. So we thank you for spe stepping into our world, for showing us what grace and truth look like for showing us, in fact, what the whole world is meant for, the universe itself. We thank you for grace and truth as a gift. Give us, give us the vulnerability and the willingness to receive that gift that keeps on giving and pouring out life into us. Even in these days of darkness, Lord, we know that your spirit, your spirit of love and creativity and power and grace can find a way into any room, can go through walls, can go straight into people's hearts. We pray for an abundant outpouring of your grace. We thank you for the examples that we have seen among us of people courageous, sacrificing, giving, being generous in the face of uncertain times and in response to the needs of others. We pray that you'll strengthen the church, that we might be participants in this great outpouring of your spirit into our world to give us all courage and strength and light. 
We pray for those who are lonely, those who are feeling uh, the weight of many burdens and don't know where to, what, what to do with them. We pray that you'll bring just a sense of your presence into their hearts. We pray for those who are struggling with employment and with financial burdens. We ask, Lord, that you would guide those who are making decisions in our government, give them wisdom about the distribution of the vaccine and also about sources of financial relief for those in need. We ask that you would watch over us all as a people and help us to pray in the spirit of the one who came into the world because he loves the world and taught us to pray saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a few short days, we'll sing the words to joy to the world. Let every heart prepare him room. And the end of this song says, Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. It speaks to the incarnation, the, the birth of Christ in our hearts that we might live in truth and grace. And uh, so if you don't know the tune, I would just invite you, especially those at home, to sing out, Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room for my, in my heart for thee. And we'll sing just four verses, the first four verses of the song. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home there was found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal degree. But in lowly birth it didst come to earth, and in great humility. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. The foxes found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the sod, O thou Son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Thou camest, O Lord, with a living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Bear witness to the grace of God in this world so that those to whom grace is a stranger will find it through you. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with you and remain with you always. Amen.